You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Steeter. It is Thursday. January 25th, 2018, my name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are streaming live. What? We are live. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, David Ansel, author of The Death Gap. How Inequality Kills. Meanwhile, Donald Trump claims he'll go under oath as Mueller reportedly nears the end of his obstruction probe. 60% of Americans now support marijuana legalization. Congratulations, Jimmy Rieferkick. And release the memo becomes release the memos. And new texts prove that secret societies actually refer to themselves as secret societies. Trump claims to favor citizenship path for dreamers. Mayors snub the White House over the DOJ threats to sanctuary cities. And apparently... GOP religious freedom does not extend to humanitarians charged for leaving life-saving supplies in the desert for migrants. And he taketh and giveth. Andrew Cuomo fresh off the heels of giving Republicans control of the New York Senate signs an executive order protecting net neutrality in New York State. And lastly, Jack Puzbiek, Mike Cernovich's alt-right errand boy, apparently banned from Bumble in a bungled cheat-on-wife attempt, on pregnant wife attempt. Ooh, I mean, all that and more on today's program. We'll get into the uh, Jack Puzbiek guy. That is the guy that uh, Cernovich uh, hired to dig through my tweets. And so um, there is, I guess, a little bit of, um, well, schadenfreude is really when that happens to your friends, right? And I don't particularly like the guy. I don't know the guy. Uh, but I don't know that it has to be your friends. Okay. Yeah, it's broadly applicable. Right. Now, with that said, too, I can, uh, uh, I, I certainly, uh, when uh, my uh, wife was pregnant, for the first time, I certainly, it, you know, I certainly remember looking around the uh, the, the Lamaze classes <laughs> saying, you know, I do remember there was uh, a woman who was there alone, right, in the classes. And I just remember thinking, like, if you leave your pregnant wife for another pregnant woman, isn't it more or less a wash? Like, why should my kid necessarily have, you know, like, I just thought. It takes a village. It, it takes a village. And that was my, so I have to say that did occur to me. Now, of course, that was a long time ago. We didn't have Bumble then. So who knows? But um, apparently, I, I don't know. I, I read somewhere that his wife was pregnant. But he did, he did release a statement saying that he just married a hot European wife or something. And therefore, obviously, he wouldn't. He, he, his Facebook was hacked in the classic hack the Facebook, use that material just to make a somewhat benign Bumble post. That's the classic maneuver. So, you know, it's got to be true. Right. I mean, in fact, we have the picture of uh, his Bumble post, um, because what happened is, I guess. Uh, someone who I don't know if uh, she's associated with Antifa or not, uh, but um He's a fa, so and she seemed to be anti him. So uh, she tweeted at uh, at Bumble. Um, she tweeted at Bumble. I, I think she's a security uh, uh, expert or something, and she may have stumbled upon uh, this picture of himself. That's 
also like dude make an effort um but uh there he is uh, on uh bumble um and uh he's claiming that somebody uh, broke into his uh and so uh bumble was asked are you still a feminist uh, dating app or the place where white nationalists slash nazis go to cheat on their wives and uh very quickly bumble uh booted him off and they have confirmed that it was him now maybe maybe they confirmed that it was tied to his facebook <laughs> account okay so uh it's i guess it's possible that someone broke into his facebook account and decided i know what i'm going to do i'm not going to i'm not going to do anything to mess up his facebook account i'm just going to post something on bumble as opposed to some other site that might be like i don't know Im- more embarrassing for him it would show admirable restraint for this person who uh, jack posobiec says he's going to sick the fbi on in a fraud uh, sort of investigation we'll see if that happens now are the is the fbi spending a lot of time um investigating fake bumble uh, posts are they doing is that where we're spending all our time on fbi i mean because uh <laughs> You know, they'd have us believe there was a lot of um, terrorism that they're protecting us from. Or also, the FBI may not have time to get to it because, of course, they're so deeply involved in secret societies that uh, maybe their secret societies are they're like a a vigilante squad for dating apps. And that's why uh, Posbiak or whatever his name is, is going to be able to... um, why is it those, those alt-right guys all have very difficult to pronounce names? Have you noticed that? Cernovich, Cernovich, he doesn't even seem to be able to pronounce it correctly. Posbiak, what is that? Sounds like you got a problem with a certain type of European. They yeah, say, I they guess say, so. Yeah, nationalism is most extreme at the periphery, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, so, all right, speaking of uh, the, the, the blockbuster story. Now, as you know, Devin Nunez um, has written a memo based upon secret information, supposedly, that he had access to. He's released them. He's, he's written a memo. The memo itself is not classified. It's supposedly based on classified material. Members of the DOJ, appointed by Trump, conservative members, have criticized Nunez for even contemplating releasing a a memo that might have a second-order secret material without running it by the DOJ first. Um, Nevertheless, apparently there's another memo that's been drawn up from the same material uh, by less um, kooky people, I guess. And uh, now, uh, I don't know if that conflates the release the memo hashtag that uh, some people seem to be so excited about. But what is also clear is that ABC has now got their hands on the basis for, well, this, I'll remind you, this is Ron Johnson's claim the other night on Fox News. Society, we, we, have, we have an informant that's talking about a, a group that were holding secret meetings off-site. There is, there's so much smoke here, there's so much Boy, suspicion. Let's, let's stop there. A secret society, the, a secret meetings off-site of the Justice Department. Correct. What, and you have an informant saying that? Yes. <laughs> is anything Pause it for one second. No. Now that yes, did that yes not seem like the biggest like, uh, yes. Can we just go back? Maybe I'm projecting on this, but he, I mean, usually in these type of situations, what you say is, I'm not going to confirm or deny anything. Because if you did have an informant, right, who's still at the FBI, you might want to protect them. But let's watch Ron Johnson. Remember, this guy's no brainiac. So let's stop there. A secret society, a secret meetings off-site of the Justice Department. Correct. Right. And you have an informant saying that? Yes. Is there anything more about that? No, we have to dig into it. Well, we, have, we have to dig into it. Well, uh, and now this, there's a secret society to having off-site meetings, according to an informant. Uh, but here is uh, Lou Dobbs. And he's gearing up, ladies and gentlemen. Do you understand? This is war. Good evening, everybody. It may be time to declare war outright against the deep state and clear out the rot in the upper levels <laughs> Can of we just the. Pause FBI? it for one second. 
What does that mean to declare war outright? Like, what would that look like? It may be time. It, it may be time because you don't, we need to, let's. It's hard to know when to declare. Outright. It's hard to know when to declare outright war. And then super hard to know what the hell that means. I think it means mean tweets. Mean, I tw- say. <laughs> mean tweets. All right, let's, let's continue. I and the Justice Department, yes, I said the rot. The FBI and the DOJ have broken the public trust by destroying evidence, defying oversight, and actively trying to bring down the Trump presidency. Tonight, there are new concerns that anti-Trump FBI officials formed even a secret society at the FBI to subvert the president after his election. That's according to two Republican lawmakers who've seen some of the thousands of texts between the FBI's Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. Mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have the tweet that gives insight into the secret society. ABC News. uh, Lawmakers have refused (laughs) to publicly release the full text message between (laughs) between, uh, Lisa Page and Peter Strozak. Sent the day after Trump won the 2016 presidential election. But ABC News has obtained a copy of the one message that Republicans appear to be citing. And it's unclear if the message's reference to a secret society may have been made in jest. Well, folks, you will have the opportunity to decide. Quote, this is uh, Lisa Page. Are you even going to give out your calendars? I don't know what that's a reference to, but maybe the guy does like every year in December, like a lot of people do, like they send out calendars, people, (laughs) for like the new year. Seems kind of depressing. Remember, this is the day after Donald Trump won when um, a lot of people in the country were pretty depressed. (laughs) Maybe it should just be the first meeting of the secret society. (laughs) <laughs> there you go, ladies and gentlemen. I know I refer to all my secret societies that I'm in as secret societies. Of course. In text messages. It's a double, it's a double, it's a double, uh, a double blind drop. So you say secret society because no one would think you would refer to your secret society as secret society. They would think you're joking. Mm. But that's why you name your secret society secret society. But then smart people would know that that's what you're doing. And they would assume it's not a secret society. However, smarter people would know that you would think that smart people would not think that it was a secret society. So there's another layer. It is, in fact, a secret society. Ask Ron Johnson. Does he have an informant? Yeah. Yes. This stuff is a hall of mirrors. It is a hall of mirrors. But, Inconceivable. And that's the only reason why, of course, because it's such a hall of mirrors, why Lou Dobbs say it may be time to declare outright war on the deep state. Uh, stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, if, if we get the word that it is definitely time for outright war. I mean, what is a secret society? What is a relationship but a secret society of two? How's that music not kicking in after that? All right. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, doctor and social epidemiologist David Ansel on the death gap, how inequality kills.
We are back. Sam Cedar <clears throat> on the Majority Report on the, flo- uh, the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Dr. David Ansel. He is the Senior Vice President for Community Health Equity at the Rush University Medical Center. Uh, he is also a social epidemiologist and, of course, the author of his most recent, The Death Gap, How Inequality Kills. Um, uh, David, welcome to the program. Thank you, Sam. So let's, I mean, let's start with uh, just the, the, the broad premise of your book, that um, inequality kills. It, it, it's broader than just the idea of, of I guess, a care to health, uh, access to health care. Yes. If you think about uh, uh, health uh, in general and what drives health, health and health care are a an important piece of it, uh, and access to health care is an important piece to it, but it's really not everything. Uh, there are social, what I call social, structural, and political determinants of health that are much more influential in who lives and who dies, especially who lives, who dies prematurely, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, but in the United States in particular, we have these, these gaping life expectancy gaps uh, between neighborhoods and between uh, uh, the rich and the poor, and other, oftentimes in very close juxtaposition to each other. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, let's start there then, because you, you, you talk about um, uh, really almost on two different sides of, of the street at, uh, from uh, Rush University Medical Center, the, the, the life expectancy disparity is, is massive. So, so uh, we can talk about Chicago, but this is true in every city in America. But so you take the Gold Coast in Chicago, life expectancy is 85. Uh, if the Gold Coast was a country, it'd be ranked number one in the world, think Japan. But you go seven stops down the blue line, the train line that heads east-west, and you land in Garfield Park. It's about three miles away. Life expectancy plummets to under 69. Uh, that's the life expectancy in the United States in 1950. It's a 16-year gap. You go seven stops and lose 16 years in life expectancy. But the same true in L.A. You go up to 405, uh, and you can lose 16 uh, years of life expectancy. In New York, you know, you go uh, up Third Avenue into Harlem, and you can use a decade of life expectancy. So uh, this is a national phenomenon, and and uh, and it targets particular people in particular neighborhoods, and is structural in nature, and uh, therefore can be actually treated if we're willing to take it on. Uh, Many times, yeah, go on. Well, I I was just going to ask if you would, you know, let's start to to bore down into that structure. I mean, when we say it's it's structural, what do we mean by that? Well, let me just, uh, so when I uh, show a map of Chicago, for example, and show the life expectancy uh, is, is of being under 69 in this one neighborhood, and I uh, give another stat that a, a 16-year-old uh, young African, African-American man has a little greater than a 50% chance of at, uh, living to the age of 65, and I ask, What's the cause of death? People always say gun violence, which is a problem. I don't want to minimize that. But the number one and two cause of death are uh, heart disease and cancer. Uh, These are diseases for which uh, treatment, early detection uh, can make a difference. But the burden of disease in these neighborhoods is conditioned by, uh, I I would say, two big driving factors. One is uh, poverty uh, and the inability to create wealth and then sort of the lack of educational opportunities. And if you look at these neighborhoods all across America, the people in these neighborhoods are stuck in place. They are, have trouble leaving. And it's not the, what I call the three Bs, beliefs, behaviors, and biology. Even though those contribute to health themselves, it's the neighborhoods themselves. And when you concentrate poverty uh, in neighborhoods, when that concentration gets up above 
20% or so, it impacts the health of everyone, not only in that neighborhood, but in the, uh, the surrounding neighborhoods uh, as well. These neighborhoods tend to be surrounded by neighborhoods that are like them. So likely you're coming into contact with other very distressed people in your day-to-day world. And this structural, uh, in a sense, is a form of, uh, I call it structural violence. It's not my term, but a, st- a structural because it's built into our laws, our procedures, the way we police. Uh, our funding for schools, our funding for youth programs, even our funding for health care. And it's violent because people die as a result. So it's different than gun violence. It's different than, you know, interpersonal violence. But it's a, a form of violence that kills people nonetheless. It manifests itself as diseases, diabetes, heart disease, uh, and, and premature mortality. Um, and the premature mortality in particular uh, strikes uh, men. Uh, and, you know, there are mis- many of these neighborhoods just don't have uh, middle aged men and men who are into their 60s, where is the time in your life where you create wealth. So uh, you get this vicious cycle of concentration of poverty, uh, policies and procedures that have driven housing policy, policing policy, schools, disease uh people dying off and the inability to create wealth. Uh, and, you know, the underlying structural causes to me are structural racism and exploitation, economic exploitation. And there's a solution is to bring, you know, uh, better jobs and education back into these neighborhoods. Uh, health and health care is important. The built environment and violence and food access is very important. But a lot of this is the underpinnings of this are economic and uh, educational. How much of I mean, let's talk about the 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 failure of, I guess, the medical uh, profession to recognize this dynamic. Right. I mean, I think at one point you suggest that, um, you know, the uh, that the the that the naming a cause of death as the final um uh i guess death blow is problematic because and 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 i guess i'm paraphrasing and, and if i'm getting this wrong uh, correct me please but it 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 obscures the aggregate of factors that have led to that last moment exactly and so let me I, I've been giving this explanation because I spent many years as a chief medical officer at Rush University Medical Center. And uh, in the death gap, uh, I talk about getting to the right root cause. So when something happens in a hospital and a patient is harmed, it's really important to get the root cause right because so you can fix it. And uh, the same goes uh, for the causes of death in our neighborhoods. If we don't name the root causes correctly, uh, how can we possibly get to solutions? So if we believe the root cause of this is biology or just behaviors, or people's beliefs, and that that's driving the mortality gap, then the fix is to fix the individual. But if we really believe, which I believe, that is structural racism, historical injustices that are getting perpetuated into the present, that is structural in the fact that schools are not uh, uh, doing uh, their service uh, to children, that there are are not jobs uh, that are available that can create wealth. I'll give you an example. If you look at this same neighborhood in Chicago where life expectancy is under 69, the most common job is at low-wage health care jobs. The most common location is out of the city of Chicago. So people don't go, you know, they have to get a job, they're low-paying, and they're outside of the city. And uh, people are just are stuck in this vicious cycle, and it causes stress, and that stress gets embodied uh, and uh, it gets embodied as uh, illness, and uh, the illnesses occur prematurely. There's something called biological weathering, where the actual tips of the genes get shorter. Uh, the, the telomeres of the genes, the growing tips of the genes, get shorter when people are subjected to the stress uh, in these neighborhoods. Um, so that's kind of uh, getting to the root cause is getting to you know, uh, the structures that perpetuate historical injustice like racism. Um, 
And wealth inequality is a giant piece of this in this country and across the world. So if you look at health gaps, <laughs> life expectancy gaps, in general, life expectancy has been rising for everyone. But in the United States, the lowest 20 percent and wealth and uh, lowest percent 20 percent income earners in the country have actually seen their life expectancy drop. And whereas the highest income earners have seen their life expectancy rise, leading to a growing gap between the rich and the poor based on who lives, uh, who lives and who dies. And while we can all say that, you know, uh, wealth gaps are something, uh, you know, of a fact, people should not die as a result. And in countries like Canada and Britain, there's not such a gap between the poor uh, and the rich and who lives and who dies, largely because there's more of a social safety net uh, that's wrapped around people from the time they were born, unlike the United States. All right. Let me let me just um, uh, just make sure I understand that last part. The the you can find income or wealth gaps that are uh, analogous to what we have in the United States. However, we have a disproportionate uh, death gap, essentially, that uh, accompanies that okay. in the United States. Is yeah. that is that it? So I want to be let me be very clear. The United States has among the highest wealth gap of all the developed nations. We're worse than everyone else. But on top of that, uh, this is why I, I, in the death gap, the subtitle is How Inequality Kills. On top of that, because we don't have universality of health care from the day you're born in this country, uh, the poor, and for other reasons that have to do with public policy, the lowest 20% in this country in terms of life expectancy uh, We've seen that drop since 1980, where the highest 20 percent in income have actually uh, gotten better. And uh, that gap is not seen in Canada or Great Britain to the same degree. They have a gap, but not to the same degree. The United States is a worse uh, uh, of all the developed countries. For example, child poverty in the United States ranks 34th out of 35 developed countries between Bulgaria and Romania. And so these things, so when you're uh, stressed when you're young and we don't help you out, that accumulates uh, and becomes illness and premature adult mortality. Let's um, let's talk about the um, you, you mentioned the, the Chicago heat wave of 95 and Hurricane Katrina of, uh, of 05. Um, okay. how, how do these type of natural disasters, um, uh, figure into, into this? Well, I'm an epidemiologist, so I study causes of disease and I'm actually a social epidemiologist. I'm very interested in the social, structural and political causes of disease. And for a chronic illness like, uh, heart disease or hypertension, you know, these kill you over a very, very long period of time. So they can be kind of invisible to the, you know, average American. Uh, but a, in a disaster, a natural disaster, the deaths occur really in a very, very short period of time. So the social fault lines uh, of a society are exposed during natural disasters. And in the death gap, uh, when inequality kills, I lay out uh, uh, these two uh, natural disasters in American history in which lots of people die, but disproportionately poor people and disproportionately people of color. And in both uh, epidemics, what happened was the usual ways that people would have uh, to survive through neighbors, family, uh, social infrastructure uh, actually uh, were lacking. And so people died in Chicago uh, it was people who were socially isolated, who were shut in, uh, and uh, no one came to knock on their doors. Uh, in New Orleans, it was people who didn't have the, the means to escape. So the idea in, in, in New Orleans was good Samaritans would help other people leave the city. But if you're, you and your friends had no cars or, pub, or ability to get public transportation, you were stuck. And I use these uh, epidemics again to point out that the social fault lines are there every day, but we, these are neighborhoods that we avoid. Uh, I talk about, you know, the juxtaposition of very, very uh, rich, wealthy, concentrated neighborhoods of affluence uh, with 
uh, uh, neighborhoods of concentrated poverty and high death rates. And yet uh, people in the affluent neighborhoods never see uh, the folks who live in these other neighborhoods, never stop by. And while they're physically close, the social distance is huge. Um, So we could put all the doctors uh, and nurses uh, in the world uh, in these neighborhoods, and we wouldn't solve the problem if we don't get to the structural underpinnings of this. Right, because I call it, uh, the, the doctors can only provide oh, really. so much treatment for the sort of, I guess, the, uh, the, the, the health abuse that takes place because of everything else that's around there. Yeah, and I think it starts with stress, and I think it starts with stress that begins in childhood. Uh, it begins with being surrounded by other folks who are in stress. You know, my experience in 40 years in Chicago, I've worked at three hospitals along one street. Ogden Avenue, and I call my experience One Street, Two Worlds, because my patients and I experienced uh, the, how health systems vary. So the other thing that happens in here, because we have an, a, a virtual apartheid healthcare system where black people in this country and brown people get care at different institutions than white people, and those institutions tend to be impoverished because of the payer mix of the patients. They, they you know, because if you don't have good insurance, the hospitals can't make money. And uh, so you, you have the concentration of poverty in neighborhoods. The institutions that are in these neighborhoods are impoverished themselves. They can't capitalize. They can't attract the same kind of doctors. The folks who work there do a uh, young men and young women's job of trying to take care of patients. But things are just out of reach. And yet down the street, like at my academic medical center, which takes care of everybody, but takes care of a lot of good paying patients. We have the capital to expand our services, to improve our quality of care. And uh, it's so you layer that on to neighborhood effects and you have really a a situation that's criminal uh, in the sense that we're the richest country in the world. And we allow not only our children, uh, but other people to suffer in this way when it's completely unnecessary. And that's why I argue, uh, even though a doctor and nurse in every corner won't make uh, a difference, having a universal health care system in which everyone has the same access to care is one of the solutions. Uh, But the other solution is we need to invest in these neighborhoods. Uh, I used to call it it segregation and disinvestment, but now I say it's racism and exploitation. And, you know, we put billions of dollars into Iraq and Afghanistan. If we had that same intention with our, um, our, our high poverty neighborhoods, which have actually increased in number, the wealth gap in the United States has increased uh, uh, since the 1980s. Uh, and if we put that same kind of reinvestment in the United States, uh, in these neighborhoods, we'll see health get better. By the way, I focus a lot on on, uh, neighborhoods that are uh, African-American and Native American, but I also point out that in the United States as a whole, life expectancy has dropped in the past two years, and it's dropped because white people without college degrees are dying at unprecedented rates for some of the exact same reasons. Uh, Economists call these diseases of despair. And uh, diseases of despair because there's the opiate epidemic, uh, but also the lack of progress in heart disease uh, and cancer among white uh, non-college educated people have made their life expectancy experience that now of black people in the United States. And and, and again, yeah, and, and, and and again, it's not um, it's, you know, the the it's the those things that are driving the I guess the increases in the uh, in the presence of those diseases. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, immigration status. You tell a story of a 25 year old woman uh, and I may be mispronouncing her okay. name. So sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, tell us about yeah. her and 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 how that's indicative of uh, a, a problem in, in relation to immigrants. Well, you know, uh, immigrants uh, to this country put uh, money into our Social Security and Medicare system uh, and of accounting for uh, the fact that 
these systems have been able to <coughs> be prolonged, uh, but they don't take the money out. And yet when they get sick, they don't have access to health care. Sarah E. was 25. Uh, she uh, landed in Stroger Hospital of Cook County, which is the public hospital literally across the street from my institution. Uh, the doctors from my hospital, uh, the transplant service saw her. Uh, she uh, didn't have insurance. They, she then tried to, uh, mother tried to get her into Northwestern where they were, uh, you know, interested in her, do- in her uh, immigration status. Uh, and she was uninsured. Uh, and she died waiting for an appointment. So her doctor finally called and she got an appointment, but never lived to see the appointment. And she had a disease called Wilson's disease of the liver, for which had she qualified, uh, she could have got a transplant. That didn't guarantee she would have gotten it, but at least she would have had a chance at it. Uh, it turns out that her cousin came to work with me one summer while I was working on issues in transplants, and she interviewed I asked her to interview her aunt, and her aunt uh, said, you know, they asked us for $150,000. Yeah, we can't even raise $10,000. So it's the way that inequality kills. Uh, you know, in Canada, when people immigrate to that country, everyone gets health care. Uh, uh, and that should be uh, a human right for everybody. They're needless deaths. Uh, and I've seen people who end up on renal failure and kidney failure simply because they're undocumented, they're uninsured, and they couldn't get their blood pressure and diabetes uh, taken care of. It's much uh, uh, cheaper, much safer, better way to take care of people, to take care of people uh, for their primary care conditions than wait uh, for them to die. But in the United States, we never decided that health care is a human right. And uh, it's like I said, it's it's an unacceptable proposition. And as, as a doctor, uh, and I know many doctors and nurses out there to witness this, when you know you can do something about it is actually is so heartbreaking. And uh, when we know there's a fix out there and, uh, yeah, it's painful. I uh, recall that you wrote that, that really stuck with me that in and I can't remember if it was 27 years, but you had worked at uh, two separate hospitals. Um, you had never seen one of your patients receive an organ transplant, but many of them had basically donated their organs or, uh, yeah. upon death. Is that, is that, was that right? I work. That's absolutely correct. So I, I'm the exact same doctor who's worked at, for, for 40 years at three institutions on one street. My patients have come with me. And yet when I worked at these two safety net institutions, Cook County and Mount Sinai, in my 27 years at those institutions, zero of my patients ever got a life-saving organ transplant. Yet the trauma units full of black and brown people donated the organs. They went to the largely white people uh, who got the transplants at other institutions in the city. This is not just true in Chicago. It's true in the United States. So when we talk about, oh, the Canadian system with wait lists, we have wait lists in the United States, which is sometimes never we don't keep track of it. People die every day. I remember having a 21-year-old guy, father of two, when I was at Mount Sinai. He had heart failure, and uh, was due to a virus. His brother sat in the room with him as he sort of huffed and puffed, and we nursed him back to health and uh, couldn't get him out. He was uninsured. That was before Medicaid expansion for any of the uh, uh, Obamacare work, and he literally died at 21, leaving two kids uh, around, and he would have been first on the transplant list if he had Blue Cross Blue Shield, and uh, it, it's, you know, you, you either get inured to this. I mean, I think our country is inured to We have accepted this. We, uh, these are neighborhoods and people we drive by, we don't see, and yet uh, they're walking past us every day. And, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's infuriating to know that we have the ability to uh, do this. It would actually be cheaper if we had a single payer healthcare system, it could accommodate everybody. Uh, and uh, it's not the it's not the full solution, but at least it's it uh, bends the arc of the universe towards uh, equality. Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask you, and we'll get into that in just a moment in terms of a critique of uh, Obamacare and, and 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 the value of a single payer system. But one thing that also stuck out to me was um, the. Uh, 
you talked about uh, racial in, uh, inequalities in, in uh, breast cancer mortality, and there was also a uh, story of of what Chicago did that had a direct impact on that mortality rate. We we just talk about that, and you know, as we look for. Because yeah. I mean, it's it's clearly Hello, indicative. Sir. It's indicative of the 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 structural problems being the problem. Yeah. So this is a this is one. So you know, I say the cause of this is structural violence. Uh, I make that case that we our notion of violence needs to be expanded, and that, our, that there is structural violence. And we did this work on breast cancer mortality in Chicago, and I, I delineated in the death gap how inequality kills how this worked, that there was no gap in breast cancer mortality between black and white women in in Chicago or across the United States. And really, Chicago is just an exemplar of what's true across the United States in every uh, major city and state. And in the mid-1990s, a gap grew where the mortality rate, rate for white women dropped, and nobody's cheering that we have success with breast cancer yet, but the mortality rate dropped largely because of advances in treatment. And those treatment advances were in adjuvant therapy uh, and uh, screening uh, mammography. And so you, these advances uh, benefited white women, but not black women. Uh, in fact, the mortality rate in Chicago for black women, uh, when we looked at this in the early uh, 2000s, 2006, was exactly the rate it had been in the 1980s. It hadn't budged a bit. And when we raised this, uh, people said it was biological that people had, you know, black women had worse and more advanced breast cancers, which uh, uh, to a certain degree is true. But then we showed the breast cancer, uh, black, white uh, breast cancer gaps uh, in the United States as a whole and New York City uh, compared to Chicago. And we saw that they had gaps as well, but they were lower than Chicago. So we asked the question, what happened to black women's genes? when they crossed the Allegheny Mountains, tongue in cheek, but making the point that this was ge there was a geographical aspect to this that had to do with the way services were delivered. We then showed the map of Chicago and where the cancer treatment hospitals were and where the mortality was. Of course, the mortality was all in the black neighborhoods, and there was literally uh, of 15 cancer treatment centers in Chicago, hospitals that were accredited to treat cancer. Only one was in a black uh, neighborhood, and that was University of Chicago, and uh, it's not open to everybody. So we, that's an example of structural racism. You know, hospitals closed in poor neighborhoods, largely black neighborhoods. Doctors don't go into those neighborhoods. Women don't have access to care. When they get the care, it was crummy. And then what we did say, if it's structural violence, can structural solutions fix it? So we went in, got every hospital share quality data, worked to help these institutions improve their quality and these safety net institutions in these neighborhoods, the ones that were left doing care, unfortunately, not uh, the best care in the world. And we went in and helped them improve their quality. And lo and behold, you know, uh, a decade after doing this work, the gap between black women and white women and breast cancer mortality has dropped by about 40 percent. And that's not been seen in any other city uh, in the United States. In fact, the city with the largest black white mortality gap uh, is Los Angeles, uh, followed by Memphis. And uh, so in New York City has had a gap that's been growing. So we, what this shows is that if you take a structural approach, so what it was was inequality and quality. Uh, and because we have a, a racially segregated healthcare system uh, and an economically se se uh, segregated healthcare system, poor institutions, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, through the way they're designed and structured, not having the right specialists on staff, not having the right uh, designations as cancer centers provides worse care. And we've heard the same in New York City. Same, you know, when we talk to our colleagues in New York and across the country in Memphis and other places, it's exactly the same. But that leads to the kinds of solutions uh, we need to apply for this. Because if it was women's biology, we'd have to fix the women. Right. You know, and 
And I think that's this a big because most oncologists will say, oh, it's, it's biological. No, there's a we would all agree that you want to get in for cancer early and you want to get the right appropriate treatment. And these women were not getting the appropriate treatment. How much, and that's unacceptable. How much of this is a, a, a function, just broadly speaking, of, of capitalism, uh, or is it more specifically just the commodification of, of health care? I mean, when we talk about this disparity between uh, hospitals in, in poor neighbors, uh, neighborhoods versus uh, rich neighborhoods. Okay, so that's a great question. Uh, and in the death gap, uh, I, I'm not, I, I'm expound on this a little bit. So you, you can't explain the, uh, gaps we have without looking at the, uh, structural, uh, historical injustices like structural racism. Capitalism as a economic system is designed to do one thing, concentrate capital. It's a well-run capitalistic system. Uh, concentrates capital in the hands of the few at the expense of many. Uh, that's the way capitalism works. And for the many good things that it does, if you don't regulate capitalism, and we, we live in a fairly unregulated capitalist system, people suffer uh, and, and they, they die. You add on to that racism that have segregated people by color into neighborhoods. So this is, there are 38,000 zip codes in the United States. And about 75% of black people live in 2,500 zip codes. And uh, 75% of Latinos live in 3,500 zip codes. And so those, when you concentrate poverty and race, uh, and then you have the way that uh, healthcare institutions are funded uh, under a capitalist system by how much they can make, why would a hospital move into a poor neighborhood when the reimbursement's bad? Why would a doctor move into there where you, unless it's a moral mission, uh, unless our system was structured to say it doesn't make any difference where you work? And so I do think it's a combination of structural racism. I call it the uh, unregulated uh, capitalism uh, and the lack of a universal health care system, uh, uh, because this is this system is designed to give the results we actually get. You know, in the United States, it turns out that where you where uh, if you have a bit of money, say over seventy thousand dollars as a family, doesn't matter where you live, you're going to live a nice, uh, decent life, unless you do something stupid. But it makes a big difference where you live when you're poor, and you live five years less if you're poor in say Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, than for example in, um, you know, uh, San Francisco, for example. Uh, being poor in the United States, you have a lower life expectancy than being poor in Costa Rica because their social safety Internet uh, is stronger for the poor than ours uh, is. So capitalism does play a role. Uh, racism and structural racism and the history of, of uh, uh, the way we uh, segregated uh, our institutions in our neighborhoods, uh, the way we uh, – allow the wealthy uh, to benefit uh, and the poor to suffer. You know, the word equity means those who need more get more. And yet we have, uh, you know, systems in place where those who have more get more. And only if we regulate it uh, uh, will we fix it. And that's why I criticize the Affordable Care Act. I got to tell you, I live in a state where it's expand, Medicaid is expanded, and every day in my office, I see p patients who never had access to medical care, men and women, and they all have something. So I don't want to be overly critical of something that expanded health care, but uh, without a single-payer approach, which I would improve Medicare for all that levels the playing field, because not all institutions take Medicaid. <clears throat> Not all doctors take Medicaid, which is a big part of the expansion. There are high co-pays and deductibles uh, that keep people from seeking their care. And uh, medical bankrupt, when you get cancer or something, you can't work anymore. And many people have to go bankrupt, uh, even if they have a health insurance card. So uh, because of medical bills. So we, it's, you know, it was definitely an improvement. Uh, I'm certainly one of the ones fighting against repeal and replace. But I actually think we, in, we need a single-payer improved health care for all 
Medicare for all and as the one so structural solution to uh, of many that need to be put in place. David Ansel, the book is The Death Gap, How Inequality Kills. We will uh, post that on uh, Majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Sam, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks. I'm going to head into uh, the fun half, uh, wherein we will play a couple more um, uh, clips. Of the day, uh, go over some of the news, take your uh, phone calls and IMs, uh, of course, as we do on a regular basis around here. And uh, just a reminder, it is your support that makes this show possible. The way it works around here is um, we do a free uh, show every day and... um, this we th- what we've just had is an example of that uh, free show, and then uh, we ask folks if you have the financial means to support it because you enjoy the show or you think it's important, you think that uh, you hear uh, uh, interesting uh, perspectives and uh, glean some information. Um, then uh, we ask you to support by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. And as our way of saying thank you, we say like, hey, there's a, we're going to unlock for you a whole new world of podcast experience that um, is uh, often even funner than the, the first half of the show. And, but we just call it the fun half uh, because to call it the funner half would be a little bit judgmental in a way. Fun half doesn't necessarily mean that the first half wasn't fun. It just means that the second half is guaranteed to be fun. That's the theory anyways. Uh, And of course, uh, as always, if you do not have the financial means but want access to the fun half, you will not be locked out for financial reasons. Sometimes we're a little slow in our response time, but send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com and uh, just let us know that um, and we'll make a deal with you. We we will. We're like. One of those car dealerships. Like, there's no, we don't turn anybody away. Subprime memberships? It's all got. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, but if you do have the financial means, join the majority report.com. Of course, uh, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Our longest sponsor, ladies and gentlemen. Our longest, is that how you say that? Longest sponsor? Our tallest sponsor. No. Our most long-time sponsor. Sponsor us long time. Uh, Their fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. It's a co-op. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. Buy the Majority Report blend. Brendan's favorite coffee now. Oh, yeah. He's so excited. So excited by it. Um, And uh, don't forget, uh, TMBS was uh, Tuesday night. And uh, I'm not going to say anything about uh, Jamie's Patreon because she wants the next wave of people. So we'll wait. Well wait on that. So we'll wait. Till, we'll, 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 we'll. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 646-257-3920 is the number. Uh, see you in the fun half.